Early in Matthew's Gospel, he speaks of John the Baptist. Matthew writes in chapter 3, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Just one chapter later, Matthew describes the Savior. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is repentance? How does a person properly honor the command to repent? That's the subject of this edition of Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rathert with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. You will find this episode as well as all of our other episodes on our website, cacg.stjamesglencarbon.org. Aaron, the command to repent comes early, not only in Matthew, but also in Mark and Luke. So what does it mean to repent? The word repent, um, whether it's in um, the Hebrew Bible or in the Greek New Testament, means the same thing. It just literally means to turn. And it's this notion of you're headed in one direction and uh, realizing that it's the wrong direction, uh, turning around and going in a different direction is repenting. That's what it literally means. Now, when non-Christians hear Christians talk about repent, what they usually hear is give up doing the bad things that we think you're doing. That's what non-Christians usually hear is like you get these bad that behaviors. we think they're doing. Sure, that's a part of it. I mean, yeah, uh, uh, Christians uh, think that people do bad things and they're telling us to stop doing bad things. So repent and give up your you know, your vices, your womanizing and your uh, heavy alcohol drinking and uh, all the all the things that uh, make life enjoyable. Uh, stop doing those things. <laughs> and, uh, and, and and certainly, I mean, there there are ways that God wants to wants us to live our life, but the word repentance almost always is not referring to individual, uh, you know, private sins. It's almost always a much, much bigger term. It, o- it almost always means stop being human your way and start being human the way that God is calling you to be. I, there's one. I, let me. See, there's one good example that I've read, which is um, from the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, and uh, this is a this is a fantastic example because he's illustrating what the word repent as well as what the word believe means in the New Testament. And he's telling a story. This is in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, N.T. Wright is describing Josephus, the great first century Jewish, not a Christian, a great first century Jewish historian in his autobiography, The Life of Josephus. He's telling this story about um, AD 66. Uh, Josephus is, uh, he's a Jew. He's a Jewish general fighting against the Romans. When he sees that the Romans are going to win the uh, Jewish Roman War of AD 66 to 70, he goes to the other side. He abandons the Jews and goes over to work for the Romans. And part of his job is to uh, interact with uh, other Jews once he becomes, uh, you know, working for the Romans, to interact with the other Jews and to try to put down the rebellion from the inside out. And uh, so he's going around, he's in Galilee, and he's he's trying to... uh, meet up with rebels, and he meets up with this one rebel uh, named, uh, interestingly enough, named uh, Jesus or Joshua. Jesus is a common name in first century Israel. And uh, this rebel Jesus is has plotted to kill the traitor Josephus, uh, but Josephus uh, gets the better of him and captures him and talks to him and says to him, um, hey, I know what you've done. I, I know... Uh, um, I know that you are trying to kill me. You're plotting to kill me. Here's a direct quote from Josephus's uh, autobiography. He says, I told him that I was not ignorant of the plot, which he had contrived against me. I would nevertheless pardon his actions if he would repent and prove his loyalty to me. So what Josephus means there is, you know, to stop rebelling against Rome, against me, and come over to my side. But actually, literally, N.T. Wright points out that in the Greek that Josephus was writing in, what, what Josephus literally says there is, repent and believe in me. Now, this is interesting because what Josephus is encouraging this guy to do is not give up all his private sins and have a religious experience where he asks Josephus into his heart. What he's asking him to do is 
Stop being Israel your way. You think that rebellion against Rome is what's going to make you happy. Stop being Israel your way and trust me for my way. Like, come over to my side. And so when Jesus comes in, also comes through Galilee, just a few years prior to Josephus writing this, and Jesus says, repent, and uh, the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe in the gospel. One of the things he means by repent is not stop doing all the, he's talking to a lot of Jews, many of whom don't indulge in a lot of uh, what we would call, you know, private vices or sins, very immoral type people. But what he's saying is, is you're headed in a certain direction. You think that happiness is going to be getting rid of Rome. I want you to abandon that, repent of that way of being Israel and trust me for my way of being Israel. And when, when God calls us, when Jesus calls us to repent, this is what he means too. He's not talking just about like the surface sins, but the way that we define happiness, the way that we orient our lives towards our own personal goals, Jesus is saying, give up that way. Whatever that is, Western individualism, materialism, uh, you know, the, the pleasure being the ultimate good, those sorts of things. Give that up and trust me. Repent from that and turn to me and trust me for my way of being human. So I don't think most of us use the word repent to describe our everyday living. That's not a word that is typical with us. If we offend or injure someone, we typically say, I'm sorry. So it sounds like you're saying that saying you're sorry, which I think most of us sort of transfer over to repent when we're asked to try to understand it, right. is not the same as I repent. It is not the same. It's... uh. So, so being sorry for what we do wrong is good. And, you know, one of the reasons why we don't use the word repent is because it has this connotation of, you know, street preachers and, uh, you know, uh, John Brown with his hair sticking straight up and his eyes all crazy, you know, telling people to repent of slavery. And, you know, we all agree that slavery is wrong. But that whole notion of like the, uh, the crazy street prophet, uh, we all kind of want to avoid that. And so repent is kind the of end a, is near. Yes, yeah. We kind of want, want to avoid that whole vibe of uh, um, uh, fanaticism. But being sorry actually is, you know, um, being sorry is an emotional state, and it's important that we be sorry for what we do wrong. It's uh, uh, it's a cold person who hurts somebody else and doesn't feel any sort of sorrow for it. But it's not enough. Um, just telling somebody that you're sorry describing to them how you feel bad is not enough. We've talked in earlier episodes about the need for forgiveness, like telling somebody, I'm sorry I hurt you is one thing. Asking somebody to forgive you, to take the step of carrying the pain that you've caused them for you on their own shoulders, that's a, that's an entirely different thing. And, and repentance is, is in fact the same way. Repentance is, being sorry and repenting are not the same things. Although in order to repent, you do need to be sorry. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, he has this little interesting conversation in there about um, sorrow. And he says, there's a sorrow that doesn't lead to repentance. Uh, there's a sorrow that leads to death. Uh, being sorry for your sins without repenting, it's possible to be sorry for your sins without repenting, be sorry for your rebellion against God and not repent, will lead to death. But Is that what says, Judas did? Does Judas fit into that category? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's very, very sorry for the brokenness of his world, for... Uh, who he's become. He's Betraying become someone who betrays his friend, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's shown him immense amounts of kindness and acceptance, acceptance. But it's not a godly sorrow, Paul says, and so it leads to death, whereas a godly sorrow leads to repentance. Um, a sorrow, that, so you can be sorrow, you can have a sorrow that's not a godly sorrow, and that kind of sorrow is like, you know, your example of Judas is a good example. Sorry for what you've done wrong. Sorry for the damage you've caused. Sorry for getting caught. Sorry for the ramifications of, of uh, um, how you've hurt other people. Sorry that people now see you for who you are, you know, a betrayer or a liar or a, an adulterer or whatever it is, a drunkard. You know, you're sorry for those things, but that's actually, that sorrow is not going to help you. It's just going to kill you. It's going to be another weight on the shoulder, on your shoulders, on top of the sin that caused the sorrow. But a godly sorrow is a sorrow that's not sorry for what you've done to yourself, but sorry in front of God. Sorry for how your rebellion against God has caused damage to him and his universe. Sorry for how my sins put Christ on the cross. 
that sort of sorrow is the kind of sorrow that leads to, that leads to repentance. I'm not sorry for what I've done to me. I'm sorry for what I've done to God. And that godly sorrow will lead to repentance, a turning away. So I, Judas is a great example. You can be sorry for your sins and just keep on going down the same path. Well, Judas commits suicide. And lots of times, um, well, there's a lot of reasons for suicide. But you know, people who, my wife had a friend in high school who, she's on the Scholar Bowl team with him. And uh, he became very successful, very finan- very successful financially in St. Louis, uh, close to where we live here, and uh, got caught um, stealing funds from his business several years ago and uh, killed himself. Now, he was sorry for what he did. Uh, I, I don't know about what he was going through psychologically, but I'm just assuming he was sorry that he had gotten caught. He was sorry for the shame that he had caused himself and his family. But instead of leading to repentance because he wasn't sorry before God— it drove him to suicide. It, it actually, literally, like Paul says in Second Corinthians seven, it's a, a, a sorrow. There's a sorrow that leads to death, and that's what happened. But there is a sorrow that leads to repentance, turning away from who we are because we're sorry before God. So the person who has just loosely, generally thought that sorrow and repentance are mostly interchangeable, a little bit different, but yeah. mostly interchangeable. Now we've taken that away. Yeah. Now we got to fill that hole with something. So I got to get from here to there in order to be where, what you've described. Do I have to repent to receive the gift of faith or do I have to receive the gift of faith in order to repent? Well, it's almost a truism right now. It's almost a truism um, in biblical studies that repentance and faith are basically two sides of the same coin. You know, so when when Jesus comes into Galilee, he says, repent and believe in the gospel. And so he puts those two things together, repent and believe. And what he means is to turn away, the repentance is turning away from the path that you've chosen to live your life on, with a path of materialism. So like my wife's friend, you know, um, you make career advancement and material gains the goal of your life. That's the path that you're going on. Very, very sorry for the outcome of that life, but... Now he needs to turn and repent. But what does he turn to? That's the question. Do you turn from that to a life of poverty, or do you turn from that to, okay, I'm going to give up my my job and my pursuit of money and live life for physical fitness? So you, you know, you're repenting of one thing, but what you turn to after you turn away from your path is just as important, and that's where the faith comes in. And so t- Jesus says, give up your way of being Israel and trust me. He doesn't say give up your way of being Israel and trust the Essenes or trust the Stoics or trust the Pharisees or trust the Sadducees or any of the other philosophies or religious sects on offer. He says, give up your way of being Israel, repent, and trust me for my way of being Israel, believe in me. Those two things go together. And so we're called as Christians to repent and believe in Jesus, and that means that it's going to happen simultaneously. Uh, maybe not logically. Maybe the turning away happens before the faith. But it does you no good to turn away from your way of life if you're not actually turning to Jesus? Now, I'm not sure if you were asking about the word uh, gift there. You had said the gift of faith. Uh, Christians believe that repenting and believing is a command. We're told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll be saved. Uh, we're told to repent, give up our way of being human, and we'll be saved. The Bible also insists that it's a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says that um, uh, grace is a gift. It's it, it's by faith. It's a gift of God, uh, not of works, so that none of us can brag about it. Uh, the Bible also insists that uh, repentance also is a gift. Repentance is not something whoa, whoa, that you whoa, can— Whoa, 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 here. You're taking it all away. So I know that we Lutherans, we— we're pretty strong on the, there's nothing you can do to earn a single part of your salvation. But here's the dirty secret. I I say dirty in the context of this program. We think repentance is what we do. We think that, no, my church attendance, that's not going to save me. My church giving is not going to save me. I helped out at the Easter egg hunt. That's not going to save me. I've been a good dad and a good employer. employer. That's not going to save me. Hey, but repentance, that's me. That's mine. Is that wrong? 
Uh, if anybody thinks like that, that's wrong. Yeah, it's not. Oh, you um, you think that people don't think that way? Well, I don't know. I don't feel like that. I've 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 tried to clean up my life. I've tried to like reorient myself towards good things and away from you know sex and money and power so many times, and have failed. That like I'm pretty much desperate that somebody else is gonna like I I I can't. I don't have the kind of self will, like just personally, and, and I know that I'm. I'm maybe more weak willed than than a lot of people. I, I don't have the kind of self will that can just decide. Oh, I'm going to give up this goal or this hobby or this pleasure, and um, do something else for a change. I always need outside help. But I do know that there are people who do have strong wills, who maybe feel like this is something that 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 we do. What but, do you say to the person who's stunned to hear you say repentance is a gift from God? Um. Well, I would say two things. One, I would just say the Bible teaches it, that repentance is a gift of God. Um, in the book of Acts, Cornelius, um, who is um, a Roman centurion, he's a non-Jew, he's a Gentile, uh, becomes a believer in Jesus. This is kind of shocking to the Jews of Jesus' day. And so Peter, who uh, led him to Christ, um, goes to kind of church headquarters in Jerusalem to report and explain, hey, this is why I've been hanging out with Gentiles and preaching to them. He tells them the whole story, and their response when they hear the whole story is uh, they glorify God, uh, the book of Acts says, and then they say, well, uh, to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance. God has given repentance to the Gentiles also. Paul, another example is Paul's talking to uh, his protege, Timothy, in a letter that he wrote to him. This is Second Timothy chapter 2. And he's telling Timothy that when, you, when, when you're – Talking to people who disagree with you about Christianity, uh, be gentle with them. Like, correct them, but do it gently. And he says this, uh, correct them gently, but he says, because God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Um, so repentance, again, is something that we're commanded to do, to repent. And so you should repent. Uh, but it's also, this is the second thing I would say is, you know, don't sit around waiting for repentance to come. You repent. And when you repent, it'll be God granting you that repentance. Just like, you know, when the Philippians, same thing is true about faith. I know we've talked about this before, but when the Philippian jailer says to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? They don't say, well, nothing. Just going to have to kind of sit around and wait and see if God gives you faith. You know, there's nothing you can do. They say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They command him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that if he does, when he does, It'll be a gift of God. Repentance is the same way. We're commanded to repent. And when we do, it's actually God that's giving us that gift of repentance. Let's talk about Acts chapter 2 here for a second. Peter's sermon in Acts chapter mm -hmm. 2 after the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. He preaches a direct sermon to his hearers. He says, you crucify, I I'm paraphrasing right. here, you crucified the Lord of glory. Mm -hmm. And it says in, in, in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? First word out of Peter's mouth is repent. Right. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Yeah. So a person, maybe a person listening to us right now, says, wow, I mean, it's the first time I've ever heard this kind of approach. I need to repent. Peter says to me from 2,000 years ago, mm -hmm. repent. Yeah. I need to do this. Yeah. But if it's a gift and I just don't do it on my own and I don't earn anything by doing it, how does that work? Well, so, yeah, now we're getting like, uh, this is we could... Uh, I'm almost sure we've done this in here before. Uh, this could be a, this could be a, a, a quite a little jaunt here down this rabbit trail. But uh, you know, we believe that God. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign over all things. Um, I, it would be a mistake to lay in bed in the morning and say, "Okay, God, if it was your will for me to get up and go to work today, I'm going to lay here until you." force my body out of bed and drag me across. No, it, it was God's will for me to go to work today. I decided to go to work today. I decided to get up out of bed. It's the same way. When, the, when, when Peter says repent 
and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Um, when Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, he's telling them, you need to do this. You need to do this. And when they do it, it's because God worked in their hearts to do it. He turned, He changed their desires to want to repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, he gave them uh, both the will and the ability to do this good pleasure of his, as Philippians 2 verse 13 says. It does not mean, though, that they were just sitting there. Again, you know, Paul didn't say to the Philippian jailer, well, let's just kind of wait, give, give us five minutes here and see if the Holy Spirit works some faith up in your heart. You know, Peter doesn't say at the end of the Pentecost sermon, when they say, what must we do? Peter doesn't say, well, it's just a gift, so I can't tell you anything. Let's just see what happens. He gives them the command. When they obey the command, it's because God has given them the gift. And there definitely is a mystery here. There's a mystery of how God's divine sovereignty, uh, how does election and predestination and uh, salvation as a pure gift coming unilaterally from the gracious act of a covenant God, how does that work with human agency? And the fact that all of us who are believers in Jesus have decided to follow Jesus, how does that work? And the answer is it's a mystery, of course. But we do know that the one is prior to the other, that the grace is prior to um, the act of repenting, that the gift of repentance and faith comes prior to the activity of repenting and believing in the gospel or crying out to Jesus that God's grace comes first. And so we always give that the credit because it comes from him. But, but again, the fact that God works in our hearts to repent and believe the gospel does not mean that he does not need to command us also to repent and believe the gospel because you he does. You just use the word credit. And I wonder sometimes if that might be where the confusion is. If the boss comes and says, this week I want you to do this, 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 and this, do it. So you go out and do it because the boss said to do it. Right. And the end of the week, there's your paycheck waiting for you. Yeah. And we import that into a theological or religious conversation as the norm. And then when somebody says, well, no, wait a minute. Yes, you are to do it. But when you do it, the credit for your having done it belongs to God right, yeah. and God alone. That's exactly right. And that's foreign to our normal, sure. natural experience. Sure. And I think maybe what complicates it is we try to understand it. Yeah. Well, part of that too is that it is within it is within our ability usually. It's within our ability to do the job the boss asks us to do. You know, if my job says, "Hey, move those crates to the other side of the warehouse." I can do that. I can I'm just assuming I know how to work a forklift or they're light enough that I can pick them up and put them on a dolly. I can do that. And so that leads us, perhaps that leads us to underestimate just how unable we are to love God and not love the world. And, to, you know, to, to actually, to abandon the, the dream of materialism or uh, sexual pleasure or power. It's just, that's just outside of our, I, I can lift some crates and move them to the side of the warehouse, but I can't give up on the dream that money, sex, and power are going to make me happy. That definitely takes a, a work of God to do that. Now, he commands me to do it. But if I'm going to do it, it's going to have to be him doing it through me. So we underestimate how difficult it is to do, to, to be a lover of God. And we also underestimate God's power to accomplish this. We, we, you know, we think, okay, so be a Christian maybe. So, okay, yeah, I can do that. Or, okay, stop loving money and start loving Jesus. Okay, let me just try to do that. We underestimate how hard it is to do that. We all also underestimate how powerful God is and, and willing and loving he is enough to work in us to do that. So at the beginning of our conversation, you said something about, I think you said that repentance in the word in Hebrew, Old Testament compared to the word in Greek and New Testament mm -hmm. mean exactly the same thing. Yes. So I need you to help clear up some confusion for me. Let's go to the Old Testament first of all. David says in Psalm 7, if a man does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He has bent and readied his bow he has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. That sounds pretty serious. It sounds pretty intimidating. Yeah. In the New Testament, in the book of Romans, Paul seems to take a gentler view. He says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. 
Do we have a contradiction? Yeah, that's a difference. Uh, the def- those two texts are definitely different, but the difference is not so much between Old Testament and New Testament as it is between in the, the Old Testament text you read there, the person that was being described is somebody who's not repenting. That's who God is judging because they don't repent. In the New Testament, it's describing somebody that God is leading to repentance. You can find in the Old Testament, you can find texts that talk about, you know, if if you if you repent, there's an there's a, a famous text in Ezekiel where God says, I do not like destroying people. I, I I want everybody to repent and turn to me. That's what I want. I want to be gentle and kind and loving. Um, I don't desire the death of the wicked, but that they would turn, literally repent, and be saved, Paul, uh, Paul Ezekiel says. Um, you can also, so repentance in the Old Testament can be harsh if you don't repent. Repentance, though, if you do it, and you, it can be, uh, I'm sorry, I should have said the punishment for repentance can be harsh if you don't repent. That's what I meant. Um the blessings of repentance are beautiful in the Old Testament. And same thing in the New Testament. That's a great text that you quoted there from Paul about you know, God being gentle and wanting to lead us to repentance. But also Jesus warns his listeners, like he says, do you think that the people on whom the tower at Siloam fell were worse than uh, the rest of y'all? No, I'm telling you, if you don't repent, you'll also likewise perish. So it's less so there's definitely text in the New Testament that were that, that warn if you do not turn away from the path that you're going to, going on you will fall off the cliff there will be damage you will die so there's both if you don't repent punishment in Old Testament or New Testament if you do repent uh, blessings and life and peace Old Testament and New Testament as well Here's a chilling text. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 12 describes unholy Esau as one quote who sold his birthright for a single meal, unquote. He then adds, For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Is there sometimes a point of no return where repentance is concerned? I'm not sure that's what this text is talking about. This text does not describe an Esau who's repenting. In fact, you, you you said the word unholy. I think actually in Hebrews 12, this is where this is from, right? It describes him as ungodly and unholy. So he's rejected God. He's rejected holiness. He sold his birthright to Jacob. If you, if you, if you want to know that story, go back and read it in the book of Genesis if you're not familiar with it. He sells the right of primogeniture to his younger brother Jacob for a bowl of soup. He's primogeniture being... The, the right of the firstborn to rule the family once the father passes away. It's super common in the ancient world, actually common in most parts of the world today as well. Um, he sells that uh, because he doesn't care about it. Um, the Old and New Testament both tell us both he, he doesn't care about it. Afterwards, he's sorry that he doesn't have it. This is what it's talking about here. He wants it back, but it's too late. It's too late. The repentance is gone. I think that what this text describes here is more along the lines of your example of Judas earlier on. Esau is a guy who, very sorry for the decisions that he's made, but he's not repenting. And so the text says here, it says, um, uh, let me read it. It says, he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. But actually, what I think it means is he desired to inherit the blessing. He was rejected for he found no chance chance to repent, though he sought the blessing with tears. He wasn't seeking repentance with tears. He was wanting the, the blessing with tears, but there was no repentance. He was not willing to turn uh, from his way of being Esau and trust God for God's way of being Esau. And so as a result, even though he was sorry, he had a sorrow, but the sorrow led to death. The sorrow didn't lead to repentance. And so he falls into that Judas category. He falls into the category of all of us, every single human being. I mean, we live in a society now that's incredibly sorrowful. That, that does not like at all the way the world looks. And uh, we all have different ideas about why it's bad, but hardly anybody is optimistic, especially if you're under a certain age. Well, we're all sorry about where we're at in the world. We're sorry about the, the, the state of the world, but has that led us to repentance? No, that sorrow is just going to crush us in the end. And I think Esau's in that category as well. So if we go to the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, there are no fewer among those comments that the Lord makes to those various churches, 
no fewer than six admonitions to repent. Yeah. In the Bible's last book, there is still a clarion call to repentance. Now, these churches have been established. They're all over the Asia Minor mm -hmm. part of the world. Um, the church age is underway. This is not like two days after Pentecost. Right. The church is, has taken root. And still, the Lord says to these seven churches, yeah. you need to repent, yeah. or you need to stop doing this and repent. It looks like the early church didn't get off to a very good start there. Is right. that the wrong conclusion to, to draw? Yeah, no, I think that's correct. I think it, it's, you know, I, it applies to church, all, the church all over the age. Our capacity for even the Christian church who in our confessions and in our worship and in our belief, honest, and in, in, in most individual Christians' honest belief that Jesus is Lord, it's so easy for us to turn to alternative paths to be like, okay, yeah, I can, I, you know, I'll, I'll confess in, in the creeds that, you know, Christ is Lord. I'll, I, I believe it. But deep down inside of us, we all hear the siren call of our culture, just like the churches in Revelation did, that actually, okay, Jesus is Lord. That's true, but you know what's really going to make your church successful? You know what's really going to make your Christian life successful is money, sex, and power. That's what really is going to make you happy. And so we all, we're all very, very syncretistic. We tend to be, we hold on to this true confession. Syncretistic. We combine ideologies, we combine worship, mutually exclusive claims. You know, if Jesus is Lord, that means that money is not Lord. It means that the President of the United States is not Lord. It means that power or sex is not Lord. But, and I believe that Jesus is Lord, but there's something deep down inside of me that wants to believe that money and sex and power and politics is actually going to be in charge and make me happy. And I, I see, I, I managed to hold those two things in my psyche and in my belief system and in my act, my actions and my words and my thoughts. I hold them simultaneously, idolatrously. It's wrong. It needs to be repented of. And it's it's there from the very beginning. The Christian church has always drifted off to worship these other things to 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 deviate from the path of Jesus. And um, he constantly, like the, like the seven churches in Revelation, he's constantly calling my church, St. James Lutheran Church, back to this, take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. Follow Jesus. Stop being St. James Lutheran Church your way and start trusting me for my way of being, uh, for, for my way of being St. James Lutheran Church. M more money is not going to make your church successful. More power is not going to make your church successful. Taking up your cross and following me is going to make your church successful. And he says the same thing to me as an individual. Aaron, money, sex, and power are not going to fulfill you. They're not going to make you happy. They're only going to lead you to sorrow if you worship them. Not if you have them, but if you worship them. Turn and trust me. Take up your cross, Aaron, and follow me. And so this call of repentance is one. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the gospel. We're going to have to be hearing that until the day that we die or Jesus returns. So let's wrap up our conversation this way. I'd like for you to summarize and talk to that one listener who might be having listened to our conversation today, feeling like Acts chapter 2 cut to the heart from whatever we have said that has had that impact on this person. And they have seen some Esau in themselves, and they've seen some Judas in themselves. Yeah. And up until now, they'd never really thought about repentance the way you've described it today. What would you say? I mean, if, if you were in conversation in your office with a single person who tells you that's where they are, what would you say to that person? I would say, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're sorry. Like, I'm glad, that, I mean, most people who come and sit in my office are at the point where they're just you know, into the rope, into the rope. Yeah. I'm glad that you're, this is a good sign that, that you are, that you are not blind to the brokenness that your own sin has caused or your own plans have caused or your own dreams or, or, you know, this path that you've tried to drive yourself down. And sometimes the path they've tried to drive their family down towards pursuing these goals, these, these, uh, these false gods. But now what you need is the sorrow is fine. It's a nice first step, but what you need to see is that Jesus is promising all the things that you're looking for going down that path, the fulfillment that you're trying to get out of money or the security that you're trying to get out of power or the pleasure you're trying to get out of sex or the uh, the, the the sense of like 
purpose that you're trying to get out of control, whatever that control is at your job or some, you know, whatever it is, your, your, your local club or your family, Jesus is offering that to you. You're not going to get it where you're going. And I think you know that. I think you know that because you can sense that this is making me incredibly unhappy. And what God is offering you is a path to get to those things that you're seeking, but it's not going to be the way you're going. You need to turn and follow Jesus. Jesus has promised that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. He can totally make you secure. He can totally fulfill you. He can totally give you a sense of purpose. He can actually give you control. One of the gifts of the Spirit is self-control. But you're going to need to stop being human your way, you know, stop being mom your way, stop being coworker your way, stop being a uh, you know, golf player your way, and turn and trust God to be mom his way. Trust Jesus for his path to be dad or mom or coworker or church member or you, you know, community member, whatever it is. And if you will do that, if you will follow Jesus, he will take care of all of this stuff. It's going to be scary because his path is the path of the cross. It's not the path of like obvious pleasure or obvious security or obvious, uh, you, you know, control. But by following his path, by repenting and believing in Jesus, and, you know, if you want practical ways to do that, you're going to need to be in his word. You're going to need to be faithfully uh, in Christian worship, faithfully receiving his gift in the sacrament. But by doing that, you're going to, you're going to be, you're going to be, immersing yourself in his story, and you can see that the story that you've been trying to write for yourself is a, not a good story, and it doesn't have a good ending. But by getting into his story, you can see the path to satisfaction and happy, what, what, what we call forgiveness of sins and salvation. And ask for the gift of repentance. Yeah. He gives it to those who ask. That's our conversation on repentance here on Craving Answers, Craving God. You've been listening to our program with Aaron Miller, pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. If you have a question you'd like Aaron to address, submit your question on the comment option at the bottom of our episode page. Again, that's C-A-C-G dot St. James Glen Carbon dot org. We'd love to hear what's on your mind. I'm Chuck Rath.